Meet WASP 12b, one of the weirdest and saddest planets out there. The enormous gravity of its star, combined with the planet consisting mostly of gas, result in the star slowly devouring its protege. WASP 12b has already taken the form of an egg, stretched towards its merciless sun and unable to do anything with its condition. In another 10 million years, the planet will inevitably succumb to the voracious star's appetite. No list of the weirdest planets could do without mentioning Venus, the Earth's evil twin. The second planet from the Sun has an atmosphere so thick and full of clouds that its surface is much hotter than that of Mercury, despite being somewhat farther from the Sun. Volcanic eruptions constantly thrash Venus. Its gravity is almost a hundred times stronger than ours, and those clouds I mentioned are not made of water, but of sulfuric acid, which condenses and rains down on the ground, adding to the inferno. But even if you were brave, or crazy, enough to try to pass through those clouds, you probably couldn't. The winds up there are as strong as some of the most powerful hurricanes back on Earth. One more freezing cold planet is the one I dare not pronounce. Although the host star is not too far away, it's a small and rather cool red dwarf whose light and heat barely even reach the planet. The temperatures out there fall as low as negative 370 degrees Fahrenheit, which is only marginally warmer than absolute zero. The exoplanet is thus dark, gloomy, and covered in eternal ice. Still, if it has a rocky core, it might generate some heat so there is a chance that deep below the frozen surface, we could build a nice thermal spa hotel for space travelers. The next planet that sounds like a tongue twister is the only exoplanet in the orbit of its star. And at first glance, it looks quite pretty. Blue and white swirls making up wondrous patterns on the surface. But these pleasant colors actually come from hard silicate particles in the planet's atmosphere, which means it rains glass here. But the worst thing is that winds reach the speed of 5,400 miles per hour, or almost Mach 7. For comparison, the fastest wind speed on Earth was 254 miles per hour, over 20 times less. Thus, the glass falling from the sky travels horizontally at hypersonic speeds, shredding everything in its path. Here's another name we'll just leave on the screen, thank you. This magnetic rogue planet, let's call it Simp, has probably the best auroras in the universe, putting our northern lights to shame. Dimidium, located roughly 50 light years away from our solar system, is a planet hostile to any living thing on many accounts. It's tidally locked to its sun, which means one of its sides is always facing the star, while the other is always turned away. The hot side is heated to over 1,800 degrees Fahrenheit, perpetually blown over with winds reaching 600 miles per hour. Despite Dimidium being a gas giant, it has a large amount of iron in it, which melts and evaporates in the atmosphere, creating clouds. And when these cool down, they fall on the surface in the infernal rain of molten iron. Karat Exo 3b is neither as hot nor as cold as some of the others on this list, but it's terrifying in its own more insidious way. It's a gas giant similar in size to Jupiter, yet 20 times denser. This makes this exoplanet's gravity weigh down on everything on its surface 50 times more than it would on Earth. Stepping on it would be your ultimate doom, because you'd be immediately crushed by the density of its atmosphere. Karat 7b is another oven-like world. Its day-to-day -day temperature is over 4,000 degrees. Combined with the rocky surface, it presents an infernal landscape. The rocks on the ground bubble and boil, evaporating in the atmosphere, where they cool down and eventually fall back on the surface in a brimstone rain. The saddest thing about Karat 7b is that it might have once been a gas giant whose atmosphere melted away from the heat, leaving only the scorched core. We're used to thinking that asteroids are the only free-floating rocks in space, but things like OTS-44 make you think twice and shiver. 
Imagine a planet about 11 times more massive than Jupiter roaming in space without being bound to the orbit of any star. Given its gargantuan size and mass, if OTS-44 collides with any other planet, it would utterly destroy it and go on floating as if nothing happened. Scarier still, scientists are sure there are millions of such rogue planets out there just waiting to be discovered. There's no hard proof of their existence yet, but theoretically, carbon planets have formed somewhere closer to the center of our galaxy. Any oxygen getting in their atmosphere will get into a reaction with carbon and transform into CO2, forming black, toxic clouds. On the ground, there would be oceans made of tar, spewing up geysers of methane and crude oil. There would be rains, too, but they'd be far from refreshing. Torrents of pure gasoline and hot liquid asphalt would blast the ground and probably burst into flames on impact. Hard to imagine anything that would survive such conditions. At first sight, everything in the universe seems to follow certain rules. Planets circle the stars, and moons circle the planets, right? Well, not always. Sometimes, some of those rocks up there behave like cosmic bowling balls. Can two planets really collide? There are around 100 billion stars in the Milky Way, and an equal number of planets. Lots of those planets probably have moons. So there must be billions of worlds in our galaxy alone. Of course, the distances between them are huge. But imagine for a moment that you could observe their movements over billions of years. Some of those planets would bump into each other a few times. It's just inevitable. Planetary collisions occur in several ways. The gravity of one planet can alter the orbit of another over time. Stable planetary orbits around a star can cross over. Sometimes, several things combine to throw planets out of their star system entirely. There's a small chance that in 3 billion years, Mercury's orbit will become unstable and disrupt the entire inner solar system. Venus might smash into Earth, and Mars will be sent on an interstellar journey. Planetary collisions are most likely to happen in the first few billion years of a star system's life. Because it's still forming, a large number of objects are floating around, ready to smash into each other. There may have been 100 planets as big as Mars zooming about just after the solar system took shape. At this stage, collisions can happen frequently between two large worlds the same size. What happens in one of these cosmic accidents? Lots of different things can take place, ranging from the weird to the disastrous. A planet might lose its atmosphere and pressure. Its entire surface can be completely stripped away, along with all the rocky materials inside of it. If a small planet is hit by a larger one, it can instantly lose all of its gravitational pull. In the worst-case scenario, both planets may disintegrate completely. But if one survives, the collision can change the entire nature of a star system. When two rocky planets collide, they usually fuse to create a bigger world, like two drops of water joining together. Because of the impact, the unfortunate survivor turns into an ocean of lava for a few million years before cooling down again to become solid rock. The new, fused world could be made of entirely new kinds of rocks and chemicals. At the same time, a huge cloud of debris blooms above the molten planet. All that material will eventually clump together to create new moons. Often it creates one large satellite that orbits close to the fused world, and a few smaller ones that circle much farther out. But if a rocky world hits a gas giant, the results can be a bit different. We know that Jupiter has a very strong gravity. So it's quite likely that it pulled a smaller but still very large planet towards itself during its early existence. The experts have a few theories about what happened. If it was a direct collision, the smaller world probably pierced Jupiter's atmosphere like an arrow. It slammed into the gas giant's core. The chemicals inside Jupiter became all mixed up between the core and the atmosphere. But overall, Jupiter swallowed the smaller planet without too much damage. This is the closest exoplanet to us, Proxima Centauri b. It orbits the red dwarf Proxima Centauri, which is the closest star to the Sun. 
This planet is just 4.2 light-years away from us. Its size and mass are very similar to those of the Earth. It probably has an icy structure, like Neptune. Although Proxima Centauri is the closest star after the Sun, we can't see it with the naked eye because it's too dim. So, all these planets, including the 24 that scientists have recently found, are in the habitable zone of their host stars. And, in theory, we can colonize them and make them suitable for human life in the future. But here we'll have to solve one big problem. Even the nearest exoplanet is too far away for us today. Our modern rockets can fly at five times the speed of sound. And even at such speeds, it will take us more than 100,000 years to get to Proxima Centauri on one of them. Well, we need to come up with something a bit faster to travel to a new home on one of these exoplanets. And perhaps scientists already have the answer. Warp drive. Ooh. This is a piece of technology that will allow us to manipulate space and time. It creates a kind of a bubble in which the normal laws of motion don't work. So the spacecraft will be able to significantly exceed the speed of light. And this isn't science fiction. Humanity already has such technology, although just in theory yet. It's Alcubierre warp drive. And no, I didn't make that up. Since no object that has mass can travel at the speed of light, we need to do one trick. The spacecraft has to move by compressing the space in front of it and expanding it behind it. Thus, not only the ship is moving, but also the space-time inside this warp drive bubble. And the maximum speed can be 10 times that of light. But to warp the space-time, the ship must be incredibly large. And to power it, we'll need the amount of energy close to what the whole planet of Jupiter generates. Still, recent calculations of NASA's Jet Propulsion Lab showed that the ring around the ship which should create the so-called warp field, shouldn't be perfectly round, as it was thought before. It can be more donut-shaped. Ah, donuts. This will greatly simplify the design and construction and will make it possible to test this technology on a spacecraft the size of a Voyager 1 probe. Even though it still seems impossible, scientists are already saying that there is hope. And while we don't know what technology will be used, in 2069, NASA plans to launch its first interstellar mission to explore potentially habitable planets outside of our solar system. You and your camera have been literally everywhere on Earth, on top of Mount Everest and at the bottom of the Mariana Trench. You've seen the Nile River, Niagara Falls, the Sahara Desert, the Grand Canyon, and a million other beautiful places. On every trip, you brought back breathtaking pictures. Your album is already as thick as an encyclopedia, and it's time to discover a whole new world of tourism. Let's head on a voyage to Mars. You're sitting in a shiny modern rocket, counting down for takeoff. It might seem like a big deal, but with modern technology, it's practically a ride on a bus. In only a couple of hours, you're on the surface. It's time to head to the first destination for any tourist on Mars, Olympus Mons. It's the size of the entire state of Arizona and is 16 miles high. That's three times the size of Mount Everest. And it's the highest mountain in our entire solar system. It's actually even more than a mountain. It's a giant volcano. This entire mountain was formed when streams of lava rose to the surface, flowed down the volcano slopes, and slowly cooled. The freshest soil layers are about 2 million years old. So scientists don't rule out the possibility that this volcano will wake up one day. Hopefully, you're not close by when it erupts. And there are statues of Greek deities everywhere. There's Apollo, and there are Athena and Artemis, and here's Zeus and Neptune. In the myths, these deities lived on Mount Olympus in Greece. These aren't natural, of course. We built these monuments to attract more tourists. There are even plenty of souvenir stalls where you can buy a lightning t-shirt in honor of Zeus. You take your first picture on Mars and move on to the next exciting place. This is a complex of 12 giant volcanoes. Some of them reach almost the height of Olympus. 
It's like if you piled 60 Empire State Buildings on top of each other. They're so tall because gravity is much weaker on Mars than on Earth. There isn't as much force pushing down on them, so they can grow much bigger than anything you could find on Earth. You feel lighter than you've ever felt before, and you can lift objects three times as heavy as you could back home. It's easy to see why the volcanoes are so big when you jump and fly nine feet into the air. These volcanoes have been erupting for almost two billion years. That's almost half the age of our home planet. That's another reason they've gotten so tall. Click, the photo is ready, and you get on the rover to explore the next landmark, Valles Marineris. This is the largest canyon in the world. It's longer than the distance from New York to Miami, and it's four times bigger than the Grand Canyon here on Earth. We don't know exactly how it came to be, but the most popular theory suggests that it was all because of the lava, which pushed the crust upward as it moved underground. Over time, these valleys grew into the enormous canyon of Valles Marineris. The next stop is Sidonia. The cool thing about this place is the giant rock with a human face. In 1976, we saw photos from the surface of Mars and could clearly recognize a human head here. People immediately came up with a thousand theories as to how it could have appeared here. The fun theorizing and speculation came to an end though, when new photos were taken in 2011. These clearer pictures showed that the eyes, nose, and mouth were just shadows that couldn't be picked out in the original low quality image. In fact, it's just a hill, a lot less exciting up close. Wear a warm jacket to view the next landmark spot. This is the North Pole. Make sure you keep a tight hold of your camera too. It's pretty windy out here. That ice that you see is carbon dioxide, which looks like that because of the extremely low temperatures. It can get cold here at negative 226 degrees Fahrenheit. This cold place and the North Pole are responsible for the strong winds all over the planet. 